the Brits saved the European Union. <laughs> Strangely, but they did, in fact. Let me start with a quote from the book uh, that you mentioned, uh, Milan Kundera's Kidnap of the West, L'Occident Kidnappé, because he wrote it in French first. Small, arch-European, super-diverse Europe. He was referring to Central and Eastern Europe. A miniature model of the Europe of nations where this rule applies, maximum diversity on minimum territory. How can that Central Europe, that Central and Eastern Europe, not be horrified by Russia, which right on its doorstep has the opposite rule, minimum diversity on maximum territory? He wrote this in the early 1980s. In 1956, just before his office uh, was raised to the ground, the director of the Hungarian news agency sent a telex out into the world. And after that, there was silence. We are dying for Hungary. We are dying for Europe. And as we know, nobody really heard him. And I think the parallel with the present is, is, is inescapable because of what happens in Ukraine. And this is propelling all the change in Europe right now. The Ukrainian president is trying to tell us exactly what the, what the guy in Budapest in 1956 of the Hungarian news agency was trying to say. We die, not just for ourselves, but for Europe. You know, you Europeans, you may piss on on the technocratic and boring, in your view, Europe that you have, you know, and you, you keep saying you want more drama in European politics. But me, Volodymyr Zelensky, and all the Ukrainians, we want less drama. You know, we have too much politics. And our houses and our schools and hospitals are, are being bombed flat every day. So, you know, I would like to have more of your, your technocracy. I want to have more of your bureaucracy. You know, the more boring and the more uh, technocratic, actually, the better it is. So here we have the parallel with Kundera. And if Europe, this is what he implied in, in 1983, if Europe does not heed this call, in this case Zelensky's call, it undermines itself. And I agree with that. But still, I lived in Central and Eastern Europe too for a couple of years, enough to get a little bit of, uh, of the good smells. Um, and a lot has changed in the last few years. Several things um, strike me. The first thing is that because of the war in Ukraine, all of a sudden, the Central and Eastern European people are arriving in Europe. Many of them have been members of the European Union for 20 years. And we kept calling them new countries for 20 years. Did we do the same with the Swedes? Did we do the same with the Austrians? I don't think so. And it really hurts them a lot. But now they've been warning us about the possible plans of Russia for a long time, and we, me included, would always say, you exaggerate. We understand your pain and your trauma, um, but don't exaggerate. It, 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 he, he won't go, go this far, but he does. So now, Central and Eastern European countries are, have become frontline states almost overnight. And suddenly, and it, I, I really like to say it, it gives their voices more weight in Brussels. So in a way, there are finally not new member states any longer. Um, they're, 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 they're listened to, and they, they are a little bit more self-assured um, as well. 
second uh, remark is something similar um, um, which is happening concerning the migration story. Remember the refugee crisis in 2015, 2016, where everybody was alarmed, talking about the cleavage and East versus West again, again this, 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 this big gap. Um, and then came the rule of law problem, which made it even worse, East versus West. And now they took in millions of refugees. And some people say, yeah, but they're mainly women and children. They're white and they're Christian. So it's not the same as the Syrians that came in 2015. That's true, but still, they did it. And they did it without complaining. Did you know that 80% of all the Ukrainian refugees was found shelter, not because the government organized it, either in Poland or in the Czech Republic and so on, but it, you know, because of people um, who took them in and who, who helped them. I know a lot of Poles in, in, in Brussels who would drive back and fro over the weekend with all kinds of stuff that maybe they needed, maybe they didn't, but you know, they really felt the urge to do something. And guess what? People I know who have been involved in the difficult negotiations on European asylum and migration policy, they tell me that you know, it's actually easier to talk the conversation between Western Europeans and Eastern Europeans is easier because of this. It's still difficult. <laughs> but the West has been talking about integration for a long time. We had our colonies. We've always struggled with it. We never found the, found the right way, of course. But we're used to having this dilemma. Let's call it that way. Central and Eastern Europeans didn't understand it even. So there was no, there was no discussion there. And now they, they, they grapple with the same dilemma, integration. So more shared experience than on this, ex, ex, actually this issue that nobody could have foreseen in 2015. What strikes me, third point, is actually that this East, if the West, if we're talking about West versus East, East, Eastern Europe is sort of evaporating. Um, if Kundra was mentioning it was, it was maximum diversity on minimum territory, you know, lots of small language groups and nations on, 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 on minimum territory, now you find more and more that it is in the bloc. You know, the Baltic states, they identify more and more uh, with the Nordics. Um, the Czech Republic is now discussing whether they will adopt the Euro because they, they find out that they're actually totally Central Euro European and very much hooked to Germany, also economically, but not, but not just. Um, Poland and Hungary usually can't stand each other. Uh, but for a while, they, they, they helped each other on, uh, you know, undermining the rule of law in Europe. But even on, on, on that, they don't see eye to eye anymore. Huh? So they, they're moving in totally different directions. Actually, all of them, is finding, they're finding their own voices now. Uh, there is hardly any Eastern Europe anymore. So Europe is changing all the time. Ten years ago, we had the Euro crisis, and remember, in the Netherlands, we were all speculating that we would end up with two euros, a euro for the north and a zero for the south. Everybody was talking about the, the, the gap between north and south. Then came the refugee crisis, uh, we just touched on it, and all of a sudden, the big cleavage was east-west, so it was... and then. Maybe we'll end up with two Europes, but one Eastern and one Western. And now, um, you go fast forward, which economies are the fastest growing in Europe? We're talking about Spain, we're talking about Greece, and we're talking about Portugal. Good for them. I think this is really nice. Um, Poland, uh, we see now coming back uh, in, the EU, in the EU core on, on uh, foreign policy, but even on, on, on climate 
uh, measures, and they're fully, fully backing those again. Um, so the cleavages in Europe are there, and they're always there, but they're never permanent somehow. And uh, I, I think this is what the, what the European tissue, and this includes cultural tissue, um, is all about. It is sort of a scar tissue. Um, and it's one scar on top of another. So you have here, you have the, 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 the Euro crisis scar, and then here is the refugee crisis scar. And so on every scar, new tissue is, is built. None of those problems and fights between European countries is ever forgotten. Yeah, that's the scar, it's always visible. Um, it's never totally healed, but all together, this forms still strong, solid, ugly, okay, but strong and solid and also very flexible tissue. And let me finish with, with another quote from a former British uh, diplomat and later a European diplomat, um, Robert Cooper. He wrote a fantastic book called The Ambassadors about the scar tissue. He doesn't call it scar tissue, that's mine, but he explains why we have this scar tissue, and I think it's great. The density of EU business, and he doesn't mean, you know, doing business, but everything, means that national governments are in permanent negotiation with each other. One consequence is that you never know whose help you may need tomorrow. You can never break with any one country, no matter how bad your quarrel is with that country. Tonight, you may, be, you may not be on speaking terms on Iraq, this was a while ago that he wrote this, but tomorrow you will be shoulder to shoulder on, for instance, milk quotas. It's a regime of compulsory friendship. And I think this applies to culture too, and I'm very glad that the, what we used to call the Eastern Europeans now fully belong to this too. Okay, let me leave it there. I agree with uh, Caroline. I think that there is a, a Europeanization of politics uh, all over the continent. I think the Brexit was the best service ever given by anyone to the EU, in fact. The Brits saved the European Union. Strangely, but they did, in fact. I mean, people have understood that basically it's in, the, the integration went so far that it's, in, it's impossible to go back where you were. 30 or 50 or 60 years ago or 70 years ago. So that's that's one thing. But it's the whole thing is a paradox because on one end you have the Europeanization of the continent politics in, and on the other end uh, the far right or the extremists have never been so strong in fact. So on one end, you have the all Europeanization of the continent. On the other end, this Europeanization, in fact, might have as a result in June, as the, the rightest or the, the, yeah, the rightest parliament ever in history. So basically, the far right now, the new, but not only because, I mean, it depends on the country, but for instance, uh, in France, the, the far left is as populist and as dangerous, and sometimes even more dangerous than the far right on certain issues. So all these populist things, now they've understood that the playground is Europe, that the national state is gone, somehow. I don't agree with you. I think with the national the, states are getting more and more powerful. Also in Brussels. Everybody's getting more powerful in Brussels, and that's why it's becoming more interesting. I, I, I agree with you, so I don't agree with me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to mention this in that, in that sense, not saying that the, the, the nation state is disappearing, but that the, they have understood that the nation state is not enough, I mean, for, for their political business. So we, do we agree? <laughs> <laughs> I think if they would not have had the Europe that they have now, you know, however imperfect it is, they, 
I mean, in, the, in this mercantile world that we have, they would not survive. Look at the UK. It cannot survive on its own. Even the Americans, who were always interested in the UK because it was in, the in Europe, yeah. they go straight to Brussels now, or to Paris, or to, or to, or to Berlin. So I think because you know, Europe is not like a dream, or it, it doesn't have an ideal blueprint. It is just a way of making sure that we don't start fighting again. I and so it, it, it changes, it's like a leopard, you know, it changes, it changes its skin all the time. We had, a, we had um, for a while, Jacques Delors has just died, the old European Commission president. And under Jacques Delors, he was a very strong personality. He, had, he really had a clear vision of where to go and how to get there. It was a different time. The commission was very powerful. Now, we get a lot more Europe, which makes the commission more powerful. But at the same time, that lot more Europe means that Europe is not dealing with just the, 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 the size of the bananas or you know the little screws. Um, but with defense, with health, with security, with all kinds of issues that the member states always wanted to keep national. And now, because, I mean, they ask for it, they have to work together because otherwise they will be wiped out by the Americans, the Russians, the Chinese, and everybody else. So they do it together, but they don't want to give the power to the commission like they did before. So they keep the fingers on the buttons in Brussels. The member states are getting in, in, a lot more power these days. A lot of things, you know, they used to take all the big decisions in Brussels and then leave it to the commission to implement it. Now, they take the decisions and they stay on board for the implementation. So we, have all, we all have vaccines because there was no other way. Mm -hmm. All the contracts that the Commission negotiates, they go for, to all the, mem to all the uh, European capitals and they all check those contracts. Some of them have pharmaceutical uh, companies and they change things in those contracts um, and they make sure that, you know, with every new order, it, you know, they see the contract again. This is incredible. I mean, heads. Our leaders, our national leaders, who have been elected to run their country, they're basically running half of Europe now. And there are many examples. The, the migration deal in Tunisia, you know that this was uh, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, she went there together with Rutte and Meloni. So it, we, we, we used to say if the commission gets more powerful, if Brussels gets more powerful, the member states lose, they get less powerful. Now they are both getting more powerful. It's a kind of, so it's the, the member states, I think, are more powerful than ever. And I agree with that. I think it's the, 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 all, the, the Europeanization of the old game, in fact. Yeah. So every, everybody is getting more powerful at the European level because they've understood that the European level is the most important one, in fact. It's inescapable, otherwise they wouldn't do it. <laughs> but then I'm going to ask um, you, you, first, Joris, do you think, do you agree? And second, do you think that's a good or a bad thing? Well, what, what really worries me is that it's, all of this is happening over the heads of basically the entire population who have no, no, uh, virtually no understanding of what's, what's being done. And as long as the output legitimacy is fine and the sort of euro is stable and so on, there are no big refugee uh, crisis, then people go like, okay, whoa, whoa. But it's they, we're, we're, we're transferring powers that used to have uh, a whole structure of legitimacy around it that was, you know, democratically grounded in a national country, and these powers just sort of float away. Um, so you end up with these compromises that are negotiated in Brussels, and as a national country, all you can say is send them back. You say, no, we don't like this. But which we immediately you know, upsets the whole thing, because if you want changes to the compromise, then everybody wants changes to the compromise. And so they're, they're, it's, it's democratic in the sense that democratically elected um, parliamentarians in the end vote in favor of whatever was negotiated in Brussels. But that's something else than, that, than democracy as a, sort of the expression of a popular will, if you like. And on the national level, there is this back and forth. And 
you don't have that on the European level. And so I was thinking, reading the book, I'm thinking, why have uh, writers clung so much to the national? And I think it's because as a writer, if you write a book in your own country, you make an impact in that country, and there's a back and fro, and it's, the, the, the media are still organized nationally, and so you can even sort of dream about perhaps someone in power reading it, or people around that person in power reading it, and there's a back and forth. If, if you would move to the European level, where's the echo of your work? Mm -hmm. And I think this really worries me, that we may end up with this sort of functioning structure, but it's almost entirely alien to people, and it isn't able to express what people want on the sort of level where power is exerted. So mm -hmm. power sits at the European level, but democracy at the national level. And that's what really worries me. Yeah. And tell me then, really concrete, what are the dangers of this? I think that, that if, if you're going to transfer these powers, like the currency, the borders, uh, power over the composition of your population, and people feel they have no real say in it, and, but they're going to have to make uh, sacrifices, they're not prepared for these sacrifices, and then the sacrifices come, that is very, very dangerous. With the, the French did much better, but the, basically the Dutch introduced the euro as if it was just some sort of new plastic little uh, card that we were going to get. There was this Banksy flop uh, campaign because the most important question was what countries can you use the euro in? Mm -hmm. But we transferred something mightily important, which was the, the power to set interest rates. And so there were real sacrifices involved in the introduction of the euro. We didn't prepare the population for it, and then it almost went sour with the Greek crisis, and people were utterly unprepared. If you're, if you're honest and upfront about the disadvantages, the risks of a certain step, then if they materialize, people know, knew what was coming. And in that sense, I think the pro and the anti-Europeans are just as deceitful, because the pro-Europeans say, let's finish this building, there won't be sacrifices. The other ones say, let's tear this building down, there won't be sacrifices. Mm -hmm. And then the status quo people say, let's keep the status quo, there won't be sacrifices. And that's, that's why I found the Brexit campaign so disheartening, because if I, I wish there had been a campaign saying, look, we can, we can leave the EU and it will cost us around 4% of GDP. Is this a price you want to pay for the return of a number of powers? Because that's the deal. Instead, what they did is they lied their way, saying, actually, we're going out and it's going to bring even more money, 350 million a week for the NHS. That was so deceitful. But it's not fundamentally different from how pro-Europeans advocate Europe, which is also to suggest that this is basically sacrifice-free, risk-free. You must be an idiot to be against this. Can I react to that? Mm -hmm. I think you have a very good point. Um, what I found very interesting about Brexit is that the main discussion was about all these European rules that they didn't want any longer. But most of the rules are rules from the single market. Mm -hmm. Who was the most active user on the single market and who wanted to broaden it and deepen it all the time? The UK. Now, if there's any obstacle on the single market, you can go to the European Commission and, and, um, and ask to harmonize the rules. Guess which country went, you know, used this procedure most to ask, you know, and the Commission is obliged to follow up and to, to make European proposals for all kinds of, you know, technological stuff. I mean, deeply political. In the British public, this is my point. The British public didn't know this. They didn't know that it was their own government who was responsible for maybe 70% of all, these, all this European legislation. The problem in Europe is exactly as you say. Politics has remained largely national, but the issues are European and sometimes even bigger. But we're talking about Europe, so the issues are European. The, the big decisions are, and all the moves are made by the governments who come home in their own country and never explain what they've been doing. The big black box in Europe is the, is the council, where the member states decide uh, among them what the decisions are. This is a black box. I totally agree with you. And then they come back home, and if they think the, the people uh, don't like it, then they will either shut up about it, or they will accuse Brussels of you know, imposing this on them. Mm -hmm. So now that the, the, the national leaders 
are more and more powerful in Brussels, which makes them happy no end, of course. They even have more of a job explaining. But what do they do? They explain less. You know, that's the word, uh, explaining. And so democracy is about more than being explained, getting explained to you what has been negotiated. Taking responsibility, that's what I mean. They but have they, a responsibility that they don't take. True, but even if they did, there's the problem that there's no European public opinion that can express one preference over another. And so if we move away from the technocratic and we look, for example, at euthanasia and how over the past 30 years in the Netherlands, we've, we've slowly come to terms with how we're going to organize death for people who no longer can or want to live. Now, how would something like that work on the European level? And how would, at some point through technology, we're going to have something as hairy, difficult, wicked as euthanasia? I can see how we did this in, in, in the Netherlands. You know, writers write books and the public opinion, and scientists weigh in. We have an election, we have not an election. There's back and forth between the government and, the, and, and civil society, and so on, and so on, and so on. But who says there will be a European rule on euthanasia? I've never heard of that. No, and that's exactly my, my thing. If we're going to transfer more and more powers to the European level, where are we going to have these functioning debates? And, and um... You know what? Shall I give you an example of, of th there, there is an anti-corruption law in Europe that's that all the members, st no, that's not technocratic, that where all the member states and also the European Parliament has voted on. Long, long, long debates. Every country was involved. And that means people from all the ministries and lots of, of, of citizen groups and God knows what. After years and years, they have this law. Now, the law has to be transposed into national laws, 27 national laws. And somebody was telling me the other day, so in the Netherlands, this has to happen too. And the parliament... Has to, has to get involved here. And then they say, and, and the ministries as well say, but we can't do it this fast. And uh, I mean, do we want this rule? They had, in every stage of the process, they were involved. But there's also very often a choice of, you know, not getting involved, of not being interested, of letting go. And this is an issue where the Netherlands has really pushed very hard, and rightly so. Nobody can be against it. But even then, they, they, they act totally surprised when the law finally, after all these years, comes back. I mean, it's also a matter of taking up your own responsibility. I mean, there, is, there are European elections, and it's a European parliament, and people can all vote, and they can express their, um, I mean, their opinions. So, I mean, it's truly democratic. I mean, the Council of States are um, composed of head of states, democratically elected in national states, so they are, they are representing the voice of their nations. Um, it's a weird system, but it's it's a kind of a democratic system. What lacks, what is lacking, in fact, is a, is a kind of pan-European uh, media system or a pan-European public space, in fact. But the, the system is democratically based, and, and there is a European demo. I mean, this is growing. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to say thank you to you all for being here, Joris Luydijk, Caroline de Grauter and Olivier Gwes. Um,